All right, let's talk about the blockchain stack, and then we're going to get into the IPFS. So first, going back in time a little bit here, uh, the OSS, OSI model for characterizing the functions of a telecommunication or commuting computing system. So this is going back a ways in time. This is going back to 1984, okay? And the OSI means the Open Systems Interconnection Model. So kind of a, a big name there, but the idea is to lay out a standard for connecting all these systems. And if you think back in history, in the history of computing and networking, um, you know, these things kind of seem like they are have arrived fully form in their you know in the present day, but it took a lot of iterations and a lot of um, going back and forth and trying things that didn't work back in the back in the 70s and 80s to to network computers. So they're talking about physically networking computers, which we take for granted now. Um, but the idea here is to see how it's broken into layers. So at the bottom here, we've got the physical layer. Uh, so this is raw bit streams over a physical medium, right? So that can be, you know, radio communication or through a copper wire uh, or through a network cable. Um, and then moving up from there, well, we've got reliable transmission of the data, okay? You want it to be able to appear as how you sent it when it arrives at the other end. Uh, and then what happens when we have a lot of them and combine into a network, so not just a link between two. Um, and then what can we do after that, all the way up to the application layer, uh, resource sharing and remote file access. So there's sort of seven distinct layers here. Uh, and this model, you could consider this to be a technology stack starting from the bottom with the phys physical technology all the way up to the top, which is a lot more abstract. You know, what can you do with the tech, which of course you could not do before. So this is what some of this evolution looks like, and you can still look these up all in their plain text glory. Uh, so this is the IETF, that's the Internet Engineering Task Force. Uh, and so all these proposals and RFC, which is a request for comments, uh, are up here. And we can see here this particular memo, um, defines and discusses the requirements for internet host software, so communication protocol layers, the link layer, the IP layer, and the transport layer. Uh, and what type of standards should the community arrive at for you know, the betterment of society overall moving forward so that people are holding on to what's good, evolving it to make the things that aren't so good a little bit better, rather than holding on to things that may be popular or may have specific interests but maybe aren't the best. So it goes out to the, the community and uh, comments are collected and the evolution is slow and it takes a long time to contact experts and get their opinions and then you know have meetings and votes. So I'll come back to this concept of it taking a long time. So the internet standard RFC, again, that's request for comments. 1122 is on the left-hand column here. And there's only four pieces to it. So it starts with the link layer. You could think of these as layers moving up. So the link layer, right, you can link PCs in your home through, uh, through your router or through a switch, OK? And they're not connected to the internet. So they're not connected to your neighbors or someone at work, right? So that's a distinction, moving up to the internet. And then the transport layer, so how do we use the internet to send data to where it needs to go? Uh, and then the application layer at the very, very top, so what can we do with it? And of course, normally we only interact with the application layer, that's what everybody is used to. Um, but beneath that application layer are all these, all these others that you need to have it to work. Uh, now, this is just one model. In the second column there, we see from a textbook on network security by Stallings, we can see how the same structure is split into five. 
Uh, so it's not, you know, it's not set in stone, this is how it is, everything must fit into this box. So Stallings kind of basically adds the physical layer there as, as layer one and then renumbers them one to five. Uh, and so the examples that we're used to here, so the, at the physical layer you've got your integrated circuit, right? So you can run an entire, um, you can have an entire application running on a physical chip and you don't need to have all this other connectivity. But if we are going to have it, how can we, how can we distinguish one piece from the next? So at the network level, um, addressing, and at the internet level, well again, uh, addressing, we're up to IPv6, uh, and then at the transport layer and the application layer. So you probably recognize all of these acronyms. HTTP is basically the layer that we're used to seeing all of the data. And same thing goes with blockchains. You wanna make a blockchain application, well that's cool, but how are you going to uh, show what's been happening? How are you gonna show the movement of the information? How are you going to tell your user you know, what their role in the system is? Well, you're probably gonna to have to do an HTTP interface or you're gonna to have to get some front end person to do that for you. And that sits right at the, right at the top. So in terms of blockchain, uh, because blockchain hasn't been around since the 1970s and 80s, it's maybe seen as being a little bit less refined. Uh, there's a few different kinds of models, um, but we can borrow from the previous models in order to build the blockchain one. So here's an example of one, and it's got the same sort of layer structure. At the bottom there, infrastructure. Uh, so you need some physical nodes here. Uh, you need some storage, and in the case of a proof of work, you need some mining to be happening, and that even could be separate from the nodes and the storage. Uh, moving up. Uh, a network, so we need to be able to communicate with our peers, so probably peer-to-peer -peer is the most uh, obvious one here. Uh, and peer-to-peer, -peer, that's different from a client-server model, right, where um, you have that centralized hub and then the spokes communicate with all of the clients around there. Peer-to-peer um, -peer we'll talk about with IPFS when we get to that as well. And then moving on up, uh, in the middle here, we'll put a protocol layer because we have to uh, decide what to do with all this communication such that it works well. So consensus algorithms, definitely a big topic in blockchains. Side chains as a way to improve current performance of blockchains and so on. Um, and then maybe the orange and the green are both application layers. So what can we do with it? Uh, this diagram has split the orange and the green into these two different things. So maybe you've got an oracle here, which is a service for providing data. So if you've got a casino that wants to bet on the outcome of elections or sporting events, you need to have some data input to say, you know, yes, Donald Trump won the election um, and therefore take it as truth. So that's what an oracle does. Uh, and then moving on up to um, maybe a DAP browser um, or other distributed applications. So obviously there's quite a lot going on there, but that's because there's this sort of flood of new terminology and new types of applications that the blockchain has left us with. So just here's another picture starting with networking and then they've split kind of the uh, protocol into a base and a scalability layer and let's well, we're at it, split up storage out of there as well. Um, other chains, side chains would fit in here and then applications is obviously still resting on top. So scalability layer, this would be something like um, how do we improve the number of transactions the blockchain can process? Um, and that might be uh, a separate layer altogether or it might be off to the side here or it might just be improvement uh, in the base layer to get more scalability, but it's getting a note here in this one. Here's one by Deloitte, the accounting company, um, how they view the technology stack. So, 
So you would expect their view to be different because of their business, right? They're in the financial services business. And so their infrastructure here, they, I mean, this stuff is all huge and they group it all together, compute storage network virtualization, where sometimes the network is seen as a separate, as a separate layer. And their network, they're talking about things like permission versus permissionless, um, side chains, what type of consensus is in there, and then their services and applications on top. Um, I mean, the event managers, that's probably a very specific type of uh, Deloitte services uh, application that they want, and they're going to throw in multi-sig multi here, um, which could be used for anything, really. And why not mention some programming languages, because that makes the infographic better. So reducing all that or boiling it down, here's how, here's how I see it. Um, so the stack here, we've got a physical layer, um, talking about application-specific integrated circuits that are going to be running, uh, running some of the hardware, or that is some of the hardware that's running that. Uh, moving up, we've got a network, and the network has to gossip to each other, so in a peer-to-peer -peer manner, there may be a flooding algorithm in there. Uh, consensus, we'll call that layer one. Uh, so, for example, proof of work or proof of stake or proof of authority, something like this, or delegated proof of stake um, at the consensus. And these numbers are sort of normalized by layer two. So layer two has become a keyword where layer two means above the consensus, so not in the original source code and the original protocol. It has to be above that. So it's kind of like a bolt-on solution, okay? And so that's where the numbers, that's where I've normalized the numbers from two at layer two going down to minus one if we include the physical. Um, on top, you've got the application layer and maybe because it's blockchain specific, we could say that we actually have distributed applications. So for example, stable coins and DeFi, which we talked about a few weeks ago in there. Uh, Ethereum has a lot of dApps. Bitcoin, uh, well, Bitcoin kind of the only or the best thing that Bitcoin does is at the consensus layer here. And so uh, straight from consensus, we've got the application of Bitcoin, which is money. Uh, and so in terms of dApps, uh, there is some work being done on what you can do in the Bitcoin protocol, but it's still very limited. And so I think that one is, is still open. Um, and also I may say that the application here, skipping over layer two, well, that also goes straight to money being the killer app on Bitcoin. Uh, Ethereum is a lot more expansive and people are getting a lot more creative with what's, ha with what's happening, especially with DeFi in the mix. Uh, so, uh, and you might see the stack as different than this, including other important pieces or excluding some pieces as well. So these are just models as a way to view what's happening. Uh, so here's kind of a, a neat way to picture this. So we've got value captured on the y-axis, okay? And then this one can go up. So we've got two different ones. We've got one on the left and one on the right, okay? So the protocol layer is tiny and the application layer is huge. So there's a lot of value captured here. Or the protocol layer is huge and the application layer is tiny. So there's a minimum amount of value captured here. USV, which is Union Square Ventures. And so they view the web as having a tiny protocol layer, right? HTTP has been around for a long time and the other layers we saw below that. And the real innovation, you know, in the last 20 years since the dot-com boom has been in the applications that you can do there. And so from their point of view, um, as an investing in tech type of VC firm, the value is in the applications. 
whereas it's a bit reversed for the blockchain. So they, they see that the value captured uh, is all at the protocol level where the applications that sit on top maybe don't have a lot of value. Um, maybe not right now, that might change in the future. Um, so that's just their point of view. Okay, so what can we do with all this? Well, let's look at what's called the blockchain trilemma for a second here. And so we've got these three bubbles and the trilemma indicates that you can pick any two of the three and the third one is going to suffer. Okay, so a trilemma means that uh, you have three paths and no one path solves all your problems. So a dilemma means you can choose path A or B, but there's going to be a negative to both paths. So the same thing here, we're going to choose two. And so if we choose security and decentralization as our priorities, okay, then scalability is going to suffer. Now, when you come along and you say, oh, I need, a, I need a million, I need 10 million users, that's where scalability comes in. And then you say, I need to prioritize scalability. And what else is important? Well, I see it as security being a, an obvious one that has to be included. And so then we're sacrificing decentralization. And so, so far, this is how these things have worked, whereby if you enhance scalability, you uh, sacrifice some decentralization or it maybe gets a little bit more centralized. So instead of decentralization, maybe we just have centralization. Uh, now, I think that security is a must. You cannot compromise on security. So that kind of means you have to choose between scalability and decentralization. Uh, and depending on what you're doing, having one of those come out behind, that might be okay. So let's talk about scalability now. And I was going to write, but I've got, I'm not gonna write. I'm gonna just go to the written version uh, and, and, and talk through it. So it's, it's not ideal, but what, what is scalability here? Well, in order to scale something, you think, oh, I want it bigger. That's what scale is, right? I'm gonna take something small and make it bigger. So it's small when it's just running on your local host on your laptop, but it's a completely different story if you want to um, produce it and have real users. So basically, if you don't have users, you aren't talking about scale. Or if your users are limited, you don't need to worry about scale, which is fine. Maybe, maybe your users are only ever going to be your classmates and it maxes out at 30. Maybe your users are only ever going to be you know, the number of uh, DHBs in New Zealand. So again, it maxes out at, I don't know how many there are, 40 or something, okay? So maybe you don't need the scale in that sense, but users don't have to be people. They can be autonomous as well. So you can have autonomously transacting environments. Uh, so um, a popular example is uh, self-driving cars. One day, you know, we're going to have hundreds of millions of self-driving cars and there's a possibility there for them to be networked um, and to transact with each other. And so in that case, your users are autonomous, not necessarily the driver, but the car itself. Um, and those users are going to want to send multiple transactions. So even if you have a fixed number of users, they want to increase the transactions. That needs more scale. And then we, we recognize this picture down here. You know, all of your TXs have to fit into a block so we've got some batch processing here, just like all good database management. All of your TXs have to fit into a block and get, and get processed. Time is going this way. Okay, uh, and so this in terms of blockchain is where the crux of scaling comes into it. How fast can you get these transactions in? And how many can fit? Uh, so up here I just had a sketch here of what we mean in terms of Bitcoin and Ethereum. So scalability, this is the, the easy metric, the direct met metric, it's not the only one, but generally it's what people refer to. They say Bitcoin is slow, and it is, 10 minutes per block compared to Ethereum at 15 seconds. 
and they say Bitcoin can't process a lot of transactions because of the block size. And sure, the block size is one. Um, with SegWit, you can get sort of approximately two megs of transactions into a block. Um, but when you break that down to compare, you get maybe six to seven if Bitcoin has full blocks transactions per second, which is small. Uh, and Ethereum is only slightly better. Um, maybe nine to 10, I think I pulled this number from an average, whereas the peak can go up to maybe 20 uh, during busy times, but on average, this is what you're getting. So let's look at a comparison to some other systems. Ordered by transactions per second, uh, moving up to a real system here, uh, a real non-blockchain system, PayPal, 241 transactions per second. So that's you know a whole order of magnitude more. And they have can have a peak of up to 450 on Cyber Monday. That was in 2017. It's kind of difficult to get this data because it's proprietary. They don't just publish their data. So here we have another blockchain, 1,000 claimed up to 10,000 per second in test by Deloitte. Ripple claims of up to 50. Um, Visa, non-blockchain, 1,700. Not a lot of data available. Rumored up to be 100,000. So this is when they would really get ready for the high volume transaction on 11.11 11, um, for singles day. So a lot of retail activity and so I mean, I don't know what they would have to do to get ready, but they probably have to pull in more resources to process more transactions or reallocate some of their computing. Um, EOS, 50,000, and I said here that it's a bold claim, right? So for these blockchain ones, right, these are claims, so that's just what I wanna highlight. So of course, if it's your project and your blockchain, and you wrote the code, you're gonna say, hey, this is freaking awesome and it can do everything. Come check it out. Um, it's early days, these networks don't have a lot of use, so they haven't you know, been battle tested. Um, the only ones that have are Bitcoin and Ethereum, okay? So that's what we mean by scalability. There's a bottleneck here. And if more people are going to adopt blockchains, um, they're going to perhaps choose based on which one can uh, offer, which one can offer the scalability that they're after. Okay, so again, just some solutions, and I won't talk a lot about this because I want to m move on to IPFS, but when people talk about solutions, they kind of talk about two different types. So you've got a state channel solution and a side chain solution, okay? So split into two groups. So the state channel solution, this means that you've kind of got your main chain and that's kind of like, your main chain is kind of like a pipe and you're gonna tap into the main chain, okay? And you're gonna have a two-way connection. So you're gonna be able to pull out of the main chain and go back into the main chain. So that's what's known as a state channel. And so the Lightning Network is the most well-known of state channels. And the Lightning Network is a, a, considered to be um, a second layer scaling solution for Bitcoin. And what you do is you take some of your Bitcoin out of the main chain, and then you, over here, you branch off. And now you have uh, a second secondary network, which operates at uh, internet speed. So there's no confirmation time, okay? And so the, you know, the, the marketing speech is that you open up a channel, you put in say $100, and then you can go do your shopping around town using the Lightning Network, because it's fast, you don't have to wait for confirmation, okay? And then at the end of the week, you settle up back on the main chain. So you've got, it's a, it's a two-way peg, you go to the Lightning Network and then you settle up back to the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, and it has, it has some uptake and it has, I'd say, a lot of promise. Um, at this point though, uh, it kind of just needs more users. So writing is the same type of thing for Ethereum. 
that's just the, the name of it. And both those are state channels. Side chains are different in that they're a completely separate chain. So what a side chain would be is you take your asset off of the main chain, okay, and then you go do whatever it is uh, that you're interested in in a completely separate chain. So the state channel always has this two-way connection and the side chain uh, is separate that allows a transfer of assets. So you may not have to go back to, to the main chain. Polkadot, I talked about this last week a bit. This is a new one, uh, a new project that just launched their main chain. Okay, and they advertise interoperability, which means that you can take assets from one blockchain and move them easily to another blockchain. Um, Plasma is another project that is a sidechain project. Both of these involve locking up a main chain asset. Of course, you get nothing for free, otherwise the project wouldn't work. Um, so that's just two categories of some scalability solutions. Now over here I wrote storage. So if you want to handle storage separately, so the Ethereum blockchain in particular is pretty big. It's too big to basically be able to run on a small computing device. And it's also too big to be able to even sync without some serious PC hardware. So it, there are reports of people taking days and days to sync the Ethereum chain. And if you want to validate all the transactions, you have to sync the whole chain. Um, and so this is a problem with onboarding, right? Bringing on new customers. Um, how big is it? How long does it take to validate everything? So some solutions here are sharding and Casper, which is the uh, the name of the next ETH, the next Ethereum protocol, so the, the sort of ETH upgrade. Um, so sharding is an on-chain storage solution, and uh, we might talk about sharding next week, um, but an off-chain version. So by on-chain, we mean that you're actually storing it in the chain as part of the node and part of all the transactions and have access to it. Off-chain solution is kind of what has become the standard because it gets too expensive to send data to the blockchain, and that's where IPFS comes in. So it powers the distributed web. Uh, Peer-to-peer hypermedia protocol designed to make the web faster, safer, and more open. So that stands for the interplanetary file system. I think that's why we've got some stars in the background here and some you know, constellations uh, being animated. The web of tomorrow needs IPFS today. Today's web is inefficient and expensive. So you may not notice this, that it's inefficient and expensive as sort of a civilian user, but as a business, or as someone designing a scalable solution to something, um, you're going to run into things like bandwidth cost, um, you know, actually pushing data through, um, and, and various measures like that. Um, so we have some pictures down here, which you probably recognize these types of shapes, right? This is a, a centralized version, or even a de So this one here is centralized. So we've got sort of the king in the middle, right? You can't. Uh, you can't do anything without contacting Google's servers. And then here we have the decentralized version, so it's broken up uh, with some central nodes and a lot more branches. Today's web is addicted to the backbone. That just means that um, what's been around as the status quo for many decades uh, is kind of the norm. You want to go build something on the web? Oh, yeah, you do it this way. Let's go back to here. So. HTTP is the most successful distributed system of files ever deployed. So I mean, that's kind of a pretty big statement. And here we have a graphic. If you take HTTP and you add Git and you add BitTorrent, you get the IPFS. So Git, the versioning control system, and BitTorrent, the peer-to-peer -peer file sharing system, uh, all together combines into IPFS. 
Uh, so what is it and what is it promising to do? So I'm actually going to just read from the paper that the author wrote in order to um, describe the project. So regarding the web, perhaps it's good enough for most use cases. HTTP is the most successful distributed system ever deployed, yet it fails to take advantage of dozens of brilliant file distribution techniques invented in the last 15 years. Right, so that's a long time in terms of web development. There was no blockchain 15 years ago. From one perspective, evolving web infrastructure is near impossible. So we saw the RFC and the proposal system earlier on, and that's kind of how you can go about evolving web infrastructure, uh, going through the Internet Engineering Task Force and convincing your peers that X is better than Y, and it takes a long time. What is lacking is upgrading design, enhancing the current web, and introducing new functionality without degrading user experience. Of course, if you build something that's better, but the user doesn't think so, it's not going anywhere, and the users aren't going to come. Industry has gotten away with using HTTP uh, because moving small files around is relatively cheap, even for small organizations with lots of traffic. We are entering a new era of data distribution with new challenges, and these challenges cannot be understated here. Hosting and distributing petabyte data sets, so that is a thousand terabytes, or a million gigabytes. Uh, computing on large data across organizations. So if you've got a big data set, actually being able to process the data. High volume, high definition, on-demand, real-time media streams. So that one we're all familiar with, right? How does Netflix serve up even 4K content when something gets popular, like The Social Dilemma, and everybody's watching it? How does Netflix serve up all that content? Um, and can you do it if you're not Netflix without that infrastructure and without that uh, checkbook? Versioning and linking of massive data sets, preventing accidental disappearance of important files. Basically, lots of data accessible everywhere. So it's kind of a very broad manifesto for how the web can improve human life moving, moving forward. So that is straight from the paper, and I think he says it very well in the introduction here. So what do we get in the IPFS? Uh, well, actually, we get a whole stack. So applications on top. Okay, you need to be able to name the data and be able to organize the data. So this is an S for naming service, an LD for linked data. Uh, and then how do we actually be able to move the data around? So again, you need all of these pieces involved to kind of redefine the web as, uh, as just indicated. So this relies on, or this is built on a distributed hash, a distributed hash table. So you may recall hash functions from earlier when we were talking about the block structure uh, in a blockchain, how the blockchain is going to store the hashes, but it's not actually going to store the data. And that's because the data is probably too big and is too expensive. Uh, but you can store the hashes. And a distributed hash table, or a DHT, involves a, you have a key space, so you have a key, and then it maps to some data. That's it. So you have a key, and it maps to some data. Uh, so here we see the set of three-bit numbers. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, uh, all the way up to 7. So as a small example, right, the set of three-bit numbers. And we could see some branching going on here in this tree structure. So what the hash table is going to do is it's going to assign a key to a node. So some node is responsible for key k in this graph graphic from Wikipedia here will say that the, the key is 110 or 6. And so some node is going to have either the data that's assigned to 6 or it's going to have the data that's assigned to 6 and 
6.1, 6.2, 6.A, 6.B, 6.C. So as a subset, right? So you take all your data and you divide it by the key space. Uh, and so then if this is my node, I have an ID as my K and I'm actually going to store the data. Okay, but these other IDs, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 7, they do not store this particular data. So if anyone from 0 to 5 and 7, if they want the data, what they're going to do is they're going to look up K, talk to my node, and then transfer the data from my node. So that's how a distributed hash table is set up. In practice, these are 160 bits, so, so as a key space, okay? And if you have a traditional hash table, these buckets are fixed. So that if, if my bucket, if my node goes offline, okay, then that data is inaccessible. And that makes sense if you're splitting up your data. You know, if you have a fixed number of books and you spread them throughout the library system and you go to Auckland Central Library, it might not have the book, right? Um, so the way around this in a distributed system is that you have some overlap. And so there's a lot of um, sophisticated techniques to determine the overlap necessary so that the data becomes available. So I won't be the only one storing data. Other nodes will also have it, but not everyone. Now think about the blockchain. The blockchain says that every single node has to have all the data. So the hash table uh, is uh, not, a, not a way around this because it's a different structure than the blockchain, but this is how a hash table can accomplish this. So if we think about searching for my data at node six, right? You have to start at the top of the tree uh, and then you have to go through, we're searching for 110, so I come here and then I come here and then my third hop, I find the data, right? So three hops to find 110 uh, and in a nice tree structure like this, this is order log n as a search in order to find the data. So it's very efficient to find what you need. So even though if you're searching for a video file, all right, even though you might have to search a million nodes, okay, you get there very quickly with this tree structure if everything has been organized well. Now, if enough nodes go offline, then suddenly you're a little bit stuck because you have an efficient search, but if the data is not there, the search doesn't, doesn't help you. Um, but this organizational structure here is called a Merkle tree, or a Merkle-directed acyclic graph. Um, here are some of the implementations. So uh, these all use a Merkle DAG DHT or distributed hash table type structure. And you can see some, well, at least what I think are famous ones, Ethereum, the no discovery protocol, based on a modified implementation of Kademlia, and that is a, D, a Merkle DAG DHT. BitTorrent, very famous one. Um, uh, Nutella and not LimeWire, the IPFS, and there's even a, a few others. So there's quite a few applications. It's all about sort of peer-to-peer -peer distributed networks that implement this kind of structure. this kind of DHT. Um, so a lot of the motivation for the IPFS comes from Git as well, the version and control system. Uh, so GitHub is a way to access and display your uh, coding projects, but the versioning is managed by the protocol Git, which is uh, open source peer-to-peer -peer distributed protocol. Okay, so even though Microsoft now owns GitHub, all right, Git as its, as its own is open source, peer-to-peer -peer distributed. Uh, and so this is kind of what, what Git does, right? You've got some commits uh, and you've got some, some parents and you've got some data in there and it takes snapshots uh, and then Git very cleverly is going to do some uh, versioning diff between your snapshots to show you what's been, what's been updated. And your commits all have this like, uh, kind of pseudo random character structure. And that's because what Git is doing is it's hashing it and it's turning it into a tree structure. Uh, so 
taking these commits, you can kind of look at it in the tree structure here where you've got, in Git terminology, you've got a head and you've got a branch, you've got commits, uh, and then at the end or in the leaf nodes, you've got these blobs, okay? So these are large objects and that is what is at the end. In, in the branches of the tree here in the nodes, you don't have your large objects um, just at the leaf end. And so even in the GitHub URLs, you'll see that you'll see like master um, and then you'll see blob in there. Uh, and it mm -hmm. is maintained in this uh, uh, directed DAG, that's a directed acyclic graph. And that's because um, following where the graph goes, okay, following these arrows here, you always end up at a terminal node and you can't loop back around. So a graph with cycles could have blob referencing back up here to head. And a graph with no cycles is called acyclic. acyclic. So that's, that's all it is, um, is a graph structure with no cycles. And a blockchain is also uh, acyclic graph. So it's a chain of linked blocks, um, which may have forks in the chain, but you can't reference back um, in, the, in the blockchain. You can't create a cycle. So this is also from the IPFS page. So uh, there's an overlap here between using this with the blockchain so you can address large amounts of data and put immutable permanent links in transactions, right? So the transactions on your blockchain are just hashes, but you can hash anything. Anything that's digital, you can hash. So why not hash, um, you know, that, why not hash that large file that you've created and put it on the blockchain? You can take your source code, you can take a hash of it, you can put it on the blockchain, uh, and then you have some claim at that point in time um, to whatever that hash is referring to. And of course, it's verifiable. Other people can create the hash and, and go look for themselves. And you don't have to put the data on chain because putting it on chain is expensive or even not feasible. If it takes, so if Ethereum builds a block every 15 seconds and it takes more than 15 seconds to transmit your data because of the file size or what have you, okay, then you can't put it on the blockchain because it will never get included if it takes more than uh, the block interval. Okay, so the very last thing here to do with the IPFS is that because it's a new type of web, uh, you need a gateway to be able to display content on the IPFS. So from their main site, IPFS.io, you can find some of these gateways which can then connect you to the world of the IPFS. So it's kind of, in that sense, it's kind of like the dark web. How do you find the dark web? Well, you have to find a portal that will take you to be able to search either the indexes or to be able to know where to go. Um, on the dark web. So the same thing with IPFS, of course, it's, it's new and uh, still growing. So there is uh, support for the IPFS in Remix. So here's the sample storage contract and there's this button here, publish to the IPFS. And then I am given a link. You might not be able to read that, but that says DWeb, as in distributed web, uh, IPFS slash, and you get a hash of where you can find this smart contract. Uh, and you can go and look at it. So you can see that contract has been hosted on the IPFS. Now, one of the benefits of this is that if you're hosting a lot of this sample contract from Remix, I'm sure other people have done this as well, then you don't have to have multiple copies as you know everyone that's playing around with this thing 
clicks publish and then goes to look at it, you only need one copy hosted because everyone else can get pointed to it in a uh, distributed web. Whereas for a central, centrally hosted um, system, you would all need your own individual copies. Um, and so that is an advantage in efficiency for something that is quite common that might be returned a lot in, in a web search. Okay, I am out of time, so I'm going to stop there. And...